everyone. Welcome to my very first episode of my new Day in the Life series here on White Coats and Corgis. Most of you probably know me from Instagram or TikTok where I make helpful free content for pre-meds and talk about my journey as a first-generation medical student. My mission here on YouTube is to give pre-med students all the information they need for a career in medicine. So in order to do that, I've teamed up with Med School Coach to create this series where I'm going to do a deep dive on each medical specialty. In addition, I will be including footage from Med School Coach's free virtual shadowing series with an interview from a practicing anesthesiologist. So stay tuned for that at the end of the video and let's go ahead and get started. To give kind of a broad general overview, anesthesiology is a branch of medicine that involves the care of patients both in the perioperative and operative state. So these people are gonna be involved with pain management, anesthetic plans, administration of anesthetics, as well as caring for critically ill patients. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the statistics on the anesthesiology match. So in 2022, anesthesiology had a total of 2,560 applicants, but it only had 1,969 spots. So when you do the math, this equates to about 1.3 applicants per position available. So out of the 1,267 US MD seniors who applied, 148 did not match. And so relative to other specialties, this is pretty average. Um, I would say the overall competitiveness for anesthesiology is kind of medium to high for the average U.S. senior. Additionally, in 2022, DO students had a 66% match percentage. This makes anesthesiology a friendly field in general for osteopathic students. In terms of salary, anesthesiologists make an average of $398,000 a year, but like the slide says, this can vary pretty substantially in academic settings versus private practice, the location you're in, negotiating your contract, and all sorts of things like that, but on average, this is what you can expect. One other factor to consider are the fellowships that are available after your anesthesiology residency. So as we can see, there's a pretty robust list. Um, here we've got adult cardiothoracic, critical care, obstetrics, pain, and pediatric anesthesiology. So there are quite a few options if you want to choose to subspecialize after you finish residency. All right, and now it's time to get into a day in the life of an anesthesiologist. So in a moment, we're going to hear from Dr. Taylor Lindgren, who is an anesthesiology resident, and she's going to take us through a day in her life, a week in her life, and some example cases that she sees a lot as an anesthesiologist. So this is through Med School Coach's free virtual shadowing program. You can go on shadowing.medschoolcoach.com and access pretty much any medical specialty for free. And at the end, they give you a little certificate showing how many hours you spent at the virtual shadowing. You fill out a little quiz, it's pretty simple, and then you get this certificate, and that allows you to count the hours if you need to put them on med school applications or things like that. So definitely go and check that out, and without further ado, here is Dr. Lindgren. So um, I know in your email you talked about a day in the life, but I felt like maybe a week in the life was a little bit more representative of what we go through, especially because every day is so different. Um, and again, I'm a resident, so this is one of my weeks. Um, this was my last week, but if you go into a subspecialty or if you work in private practice, you can have a really different week as well. So last Monday, I was in pre-op screening clinic, so I did histories and physicals on all of the patients who had planned surgeries, and I made sure that they were healthy enough and that their heart was strong enough to undergo the stress of surgery. Um, we also got their consent for anesthesia and kind of talked with them about how to prepare and what to expect on the day of surgery. On Tuesday, I was in a cardiac room. So we had a patient who had a thoracic aortic aneurysm. So basically a weakened part of the aorta, um, one of the major vessels that goes to the heart. And this patient had a thoracotomy. So they cut open the side of her chest and washed out her chest cavity um, after she had had the repair of the aortic aneurysm. On Wednesday, I was a regional resident. And so um, some of the blocks that I did, I did two supraclavicular blocks that day, which basically is a nerve block, the brachial plexus, um, injection above the clavicle to kind of numb up their arm for arm or wrist surgery. And then on Thursday and Friday, I was in the general OR. And so you can see that these are some of the cases that we do. Um, 
I did two laparoscopic cholecystectomies, so took out their gallbladder, and a right radius ORIF, or open reduction internal fixation. So the patient had a fractured radius and the orthopedic surgeon fixed it. And then on Friday, I did two laparoscopic hysterectomies, so um, taking out their uterus. And then I had a golden weekend, which we talked about earlier. About a general case, um, say a pretty straightforward case and what we do during the day for that patient. Um, so before they go to the OR, we do a history and physical, set up the OR, place an IV and give them any pre-medication. So if they need any oral medications for pain or if we need to reduce the amount of acid in their stomach, we can give them that beforehand. And then we go to the OR. In the OR, we place all their monitors, EKG, pulse ox, blood pressure cuff, and we also place an oxygen mask on their face to fill up their lungs with oxygen before we start. Induction means the medications that we give through the IV to help them go all the way to sleep. Intubating, kind of talked about before, placing a breathing tube in their trachea. And then we can put any additional lines or monitoring. So if they need a temperature probe, or if they may need like a nasogastric tube, um, if they need an arterial line for blood pressure monitoring, that's when we would place that after they're asleep. Maintenance is usually with the anesthetic gases, keeping the patient asleep throughout the whole procedure and any medications they need, um, for example, blood pressure medications during the surgery. Emergence is when they wake up, extubation, taking that tube out, and then they go to the post-anesthesia care unit and we wait until they're awake, not nauseated or vomiting. Um, all their vitals are fine before we sign them out and they can potentially go home or maybe if they're inpatients, go to somewhere else in the hospital. Um, so this is just a little bit more about intubation and kind of what it is. So this is the, um, the blade that I talked about, it goes in the patient's mouth. And this is what we see whenever we look into the patient's mouth. Um, so this is what we're trying to get. So we, this is what we see before we lift everything up. And this is the epiglottis. And once we lift everything up out of the way, we can see the vocal cords here telling us that that's the trachea. And so we can put the ET tube through the trachea. Um, and then we can connect them either to a bag, but usually to the anesthesia machine um, to help them breathe through the whole procedure. So anesthesia is the only specialty in which the physician is actually administering the drugs themselves. Um, a lot of other specialties, you would order a drug and then maybe the nurses would give it. But in anesthesia, we give it ourselves. And so um, that's something unique about anesthesia. Um, so this is a Pixis machine. Um, so some places have a pharmacy where a pharmacist will give you the medications you'll use during the surgery. Um, we have both. We have both a pharmacy and a Pixis, but I just wanted to show a picture of the Pixis machine and just going through it. Um, well, you have your narcotic drugs in these locked cabinets right here. And then otherwise, when you sign in, this is just to give you an example of all yeah. of the drugs that we give. Um, I don't know if you wanna know all of their names and what they do, but just an example. All right, and then the third case, I just wanted to talk about a regional anesthesia case. Um, so another procedure that we do is a nerve block. Um, and you can do these anywhere in the body, um, but the one that I did for this patient was a supraclavicular nerve block. So this is a 33-year-old male, no significant past medical history. So he's pretty healthy. He fell off a roof. Um, he was a roofer and he broke his radius. Um, and so they, the orthopedic surgeons did the ORIF, open reduction internal fixation of his fracture. And so for wrist and uh, arm surgeries, um, we often do a supraclavicular nerve block. So again, that's an injection above the clavicle and it's to affect the brachial plexus. Um, I know that you know about this, but um, before you go to med school, um, you may hear about the dreaded brachial plexus. I actually don't think it's that bad, but it always looks like spaghetti. But basically the supraclavicular nerve block is to help block the pain from all of these nerves um, that feed into your arm. Um, so to do the nerve block, we often use ultrasound. Um, so whenever you look with an ultrasound above the patient's clavicle, this is what you'll see. So this is your um, subclavian artery and this is your brachial plexus. So this is all of those nerves and you can see whenever we do the ultrasound, you can actually see your needle coming into the side of the ultrasound screen. 
And using the ultrasound to watch what you're doing, you can give medications surrounding the brachial plexus to um, kind of numb up that area. And all of the nerves that um, are in the brachial plexus are all of these different colors on this arm. Um, and so once you do this nerve block, this arm would be numb and difficult to move. And that, that really helps with pain control um, during and after the surgery. Um, sometimes if say it's like a smaller procedure on the hand, you could do a nerve block and actually the patient could be awake during the surgery because if the nerve block works well. Um, but sometimes you wanna do the nerve block in addition to general anesthesia, putting the patient all the way to sleep just to help with pain control.